Okay, welcome to part B of lecture eight, money and bills of exchange in Renaissance Italy. Now you'll recall at the end of the uh, previous uh, part of this lecture, I noted how during the Crusades, Europeans, uh, especially more well-to-do Europeans, um, their appetite for Eastern commodities uh, greatly increased, and for good reason. The East had a lot of uh, wonderful things to offer Europeans. Well, who are these continental Europeans going to buy, or how are they going to buy these Eastern goods? Well, they went through the Italian city-states. The Italian city-states during beginning in the high Middle Ages function as the uh, link or the main terminus between Europe and the Middle East, between continental Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean or the Levant. Now, in those days, there was no united Italy. Italian unification doesn't occur until 1871. Italy consisted of a number of different city-states. The wealthiest were in the north, in the central part of the Italian peninsula. The south, uh, southern part of the peninsula, Naples, was a lot poorer. But in the central and northern parts, um, there are a number of very important uh, critical cities and very commercial cities. And in fact, actually, uh, after the fall of the Roman Empire in 476, out of all the areas of Western Europe, central and northern Italy definitely suffered, but uh, the, the structures remain more intact in those in in those areas than than other places in Europe, and so you still had towns and uh, small cities in central and northern Italy even during sort of the darkest periods of um, in in the aftermath of the fall of that empire. Well, during the High Middle Ages, these states become a lot wealthier, and especially as the demand for Eastern goods increases. Uh, the Italian states become quite wealthy indeed. And if you look at this map of different commercial routes, um, all routes are going through the Mediterranean. The Atlantic Ocean hasn't been opened up yet. So if you were a continental European, you had, a, you had to either go by land, which in those days was quite difficult. The road system was not, uh, not as sophisticated, even as it was as it had been during uh, old Roman times but if you wanted to go by sea you had to go through the Mediterranean well you couldn't think of a more ideal location than the Italian Peninsula for that Mediterranean trade and so merchants in these cities and in, in Venice and Florence and Genoa and Milan and Pisa emerge and act as middlemen in this trade between Europe and the Near East. And by middlemen, what I mean by that is Italian merchants purchased foreign goods, Eastern goods, bought those goods and then redistributed them, resold them or re-exported them to other places in Europe at a profit. And the Italian merchants did quite well for themselves on the whole uh, in that trade. When the Atlantic Ocean is opened up and when new routes are opened up by the Portuguese that go around the continent of Africa and bypass the Italians, the Italians suffer or these Italian merchants suffer because they're no longer the center of that commercial of that commercial universe. Before time, they become, uh, become quite wealthy indeed. And, and, in, and in fact, uh, in these Italian city-states, merchants have more power in these Italian city-states than anywhere else in Europe. Politically, they have more power. Now, there were feudal landlords who owned just huge tracts of land in Italy. However, in the cities, the merchants wielded a lot of a lot of power and influence, much more than any other place in Europe. The Renaissance begins sometime around 1300, and it lasts a good three centuries. It means rebirth, and in Italy, especially during this time period, now. Italian merchants are, are trading or dealing in Mediterranean trade, this, the pre trade I just described, they're doing that through the high Middle Ages as well. But during this period, just uh, Italy and especially Florence, but really all of uh, central and northern Italy, um, just reaches uh, spectacular 
cultural and artistic achievements and heights. Oftentimes the art of a particular culture tells you all that you need to know. There's a Raphael, uh, the, uh, the betrothal of the Virgin, pictured here on the left, another Renaissance painting on the right. Um, compare this to the art of the earlier medieval period. Um, yeah. I actually have an appreciation for medieval art. I, I, I have a, uh, I have somewhat of a soft spot for, for some, some medieval art. There's a, a certain charm about it or a certain appeal about the simplicity of it. The, you know, it's a, at times a bit one dimensional, but, um, there is, uh, a, a certain type of beauty that I, you know, that one can find in medieval art. Um, but it's not this, right? Um, whew, whoa. <laughs> is this even from the same universe? Um, this, of course, was uh, uh, Raphael's painting, The School of Athens. The School of Athens. Wow. Whew. You know, this didn't happen overnight. So it was a transition from the older medieval art. This was a, you know, some transitionary pieces here. You start to see the dawn of perspective so that, you know, the piece isn't totally flat like, um, like it was for much of the medieval period. There's another piece with perspective. Um, but yeah, the, the art really tells you everything you need to know about this period. And by the way, Many of these, uh, there's a close-up of the School of Athens. This is Plato. There's Aristotle. Many of these artists or sculptor and sculptors were funded and financed or patronized by wealthy Italian merchants and bankers. We'll get to banking um, in a later lecture. Of course, is Michelangelo. Um, Michelangelo is the creation of Adam. The creation of Adam. Very, very famous, obviously. Michelangelo's David, the Mona Lisa by Da Vinci, all products of the early 16th century. I saw, um, if you've never seen the Mona Lisa actually at the Louvre, I highly recommend it. I didn't really expect much, you know, it's almost cliche, the Mona Lisa, how, how famous it is. But, you know, I went into the room and it's this huge room in the Louvre and then there's a Mona Lisa in the center and it's, it's actually quite small compared to some of the other pieces in the in the room man it's a captivating piece it's really captivating it was hard to explain but there was there's just something about that painting when you're there in the flesh and you're looking at it like wow i can i can definitely understand why this is a uh, a valuable extraordinarily valuable painting um da vinci was quite quite a genius there's another michelangelo sculpture some architecture from the period i mean just objectively uh, beautiful pieces. And I am a believer that um, that some art can be objectively beautiful. And, uh, and you look at some of the pieces, works of the Renaissance, and there's no question about it. These are, these are some of the greatest achievements in hum human history. All right, the two major cities, uh, the probably two primary commercial city states in, in Italy during this time period were Florence and Venice. Florence, which you see pictured there, actually is known as the Athens of the Middle Ages. Uh, extremely prosperous. This is where all the, the major pieces of art centered. And uh, actually in Florence during the Renaissance, this was the most literate society the world had ever seen, even surpassing the uh, ancient Greeks and surpassing the uh, um, Islamic world during the golden age of Islam, an estimated one third of the male population in Florence was literate and a relatively large percentage of the female population as well. Well, in Florence, they used a gold coin called the Florin. And the Florin was the first really mass produced gold coin in Europe. And the Florin actually was found all throughout Europe. And it became the, uh, really the, the trade coin of choice. If you were a merchant, regardless of nationality, and if you were dealing in large transactions, a florin suited you very well for those purposes. Again, gold being worth more than silver. 
So the Florin and Florin in Florence. Easy to remember. The other city state, Venice, the Republic of Venice. And in Venice, they used the ducat. The ducat was a gold coin, and the ducat was also used in the Kingdom of Hungary and in the Holy Roman Empire. Pictured here is a, uh, a banker of sorts, a money changer. And because each city state, Italian city state, issued its own coin, there was quite a, a, a high demand for money changing services. And this man probably accepted coins on deposit and then changed um, change, change them out for local coins, um, probably dealt, um, dealt, bought and sold in bills of exchange, which we'll get to here in a moment. Uh, for the remainder of this, uh, what remains of this lecture, and for the following lecture, we're going to take a look at some of the big innovations of Renaissance Italy because it's going to change everything. Banking, especially banking. Big. Uh, you know, the next lecture, lecture number nine, some big uh, discussions about banking. But first, for this lecture, we're going to look at these two. First of all, the diversity of coin led to in Renaissance Italy, a demand for money changing or for money changers. Now we talked at length already about money changers. There's been money changers before in history. There were money changers in ancient Greece. There were money changers in the ancient Roman Empire. Here's a money changer in Renaissance Italy. For a fee, would change out foreign coin for local coin. But also, there's a demand for the safe transport of money especially by merchants. Merchants are dealing with very long distance trade. And whether that trade was by land or by sea, it was very dangerous to transport large sums of money. If it was by land, you were, you know, back then, highway robbers were not uncommon. Um, if it was by sea, shipwrecks were not terribly uncommon either. And so if you had a large sum of money, you preferred not to have to physically transfer it in an unsafe way. Now, gold and silver were certainly more portable than copper cash coins. Nonetheless, there's still some inconvenience there. If you have to have transport a lot of gold coins, not only is it unsafe, but it's also bulky and a bit inconvenient. And so there's this demand now for the safe transport of money. The Italians meet that demand. Italian merchants meet that demand by inventing bills of exchange, bills of exchange. A bill of exchange is a financial instrument designed to secure the safe transport of money. This is a bill of exchange from the late 14th century, 1392. Bill of exchange was a, and this will sound a little complicated at first, but bear with me, I'm gonna adjust that. Bear with me, because there's a practical analogy here, You'll, it'll make sense. Bill of Sanchez was a written order made by one person, and that person was called the drawer. The order was written up to another party called the drawee, and the order stated to that, to that party, you pay money to this third person, the payee. The drawer gave this written order to the payee. The payee then took that bill and presented it to the drawee for the money. Now that's gonna sound a little confusing uh, to some of you. What does this mean? Well, uh, in a way, a check, a check today is a bill of exchange. There's one key difference. I'll explain what that is in a moment. But if you ever write checks, and most people don't write checks nowadays, um, it's been, I think it's been a, uh, I think I probably write two or three checks a year. So it's not very frequent. But if you write a check, what, do you, what are you doing? You're writing an, an order down, a certain amount. You're specifying on that check who is to receive the money but who are you ordering to pay that money to that person? The bank. 
you're telling the bank via that check you paid this person x amount of money okay so if you have to pay rent and your rent's a thousand bucks you know you write a check your name is on the check you're the drawer right you you're drawing the check the payee is your landlord so you put the the name of your landlord there on the check and you put a thousand dollars that check is an order to your bank you know wells fargo or whatever mid first bank you pay this person a thousand dollars in money a bill of exchange works the same way um, the drawer person who draws the bill the drawee in the case of a check the bank this is the person or institution on whom the bill is drawn and who's ordered to pay the indicated sum of money and the payee the person who received the bill now the difference with the check is that a bill of exchange you know you write a check and, and it's a one-time thing right the person takes the check and and uh, the order is given to the bank a bill of exchange could be signed over to two three four five even six seven different people before it finally went back to the drawee for final redemption so that's the chief difference between a bill of exchange and, and this in the old days and and a check so like a modern check the bill was endorsed over to a certain specific person this is also what differentiates it from flying cash you may, re may remember flying cash under the tang dynasty flying cash you didn't have to endorse it wasn't like a check you didn't endorse the bill over to a specific person it was more like a bank note it was more generic than that um, it could circulate any number of times and you wouldn't have to write down the name of the person with the bill of exchange each time it was transferred over the name of the person was was signed to the bill unlike a mod like a check today unlike a modern check this could be done multiple times with the same bill and in fact bills of exchange quite frequently circulated through multiple hands and oftentimes through multiple cities sometimes multiple countries before it was ultimately ultimately taken to the drawee for final redemption in whatever sum of coin we're dealing with this is a later bill of exchange from 1756 bills of exchange were used you know all the way up through the 19th century and again the 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 modern check is uh is a sort of a, um, a legacy of that so we'll end things there next time we're going to take a look at banking credit and uh, some uh, topics that will remain with us for for the rest of this course so i will see you next time for lecture nine until then so long